All right, do you guys remember where Philippians is? It's in a couple weeks, right? I'm excited to get back. Philippians chapter 3 this morning, so please find a Bible. Turn with me there. Philippians chapter 3. Figured we'd ease in with three verses. What do you think? Philippians 3, 1 through 3. And so let me invite you to turn, and as you do, let's uh, just stop and confess our need for God's grace and help at this time. So let's pray. Father God, again, we, we recognize the word which we're about to read, and we pray would have, uh, have it read us, challenge us, convict us, equip us, correct us, make us uh, conform to the truth. And so, Father God, we pray for your Spirit's work to take the sword of the Spirit and wield it upon our hearts. And just remove any extra, Lord, that's there. And, and Lord, use this time for your glory and for your honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, reading from Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. This is what Paul writes. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. For those who have ears to hear, let them hear the truth of God's word. Have you ever had something embarrassing happening to you because you weren't paying attention? Can you think of anything? I had something just this past week. I was driving in Lancaster City. I was beginning to make a left turn. And suddenly I heard not just one car beeping at me. A whole host of cars beeping at me. Do you know why they were beeping at me? Wrong way on a one-way street. Yep. That's embarrassing, right? You have to try to turn around and cover your face at the same time. People don't know it was you. And so you have to be, have to be careful. Otherwise, you can find yourself in an embarrassing situation. The advent of smartphones has only made this worse. and has caused humanity to stop paying attention at a record pace. And I don't know if you've seen the video. I think it's a few years old at this point. The video of a woman walking in the mall texting. Have you seen it? She's texting as she's walking in the mall, and she walks literally right into a fountain. Right in the fountain. I, was, I debated. I, I, I pulled up the video. I was like, should I show it at the beginning of the sermon? And then I was like, well, it's kind of not nice. And also, the, the footage was grainy. I think if we had a good video, I'd say, yeah, let's do it. But you can Google it. It's out there for you. Just type in woman walking into a mall fountain, okay? She wasn't paying attention to her surroundings. And so it's easy for us to get ourselves in trouble with all man manner of potential hazards around us if we're not paying attention, all right? And if you know that's true in life, you, you know this is true with your spiritual life in Christ, right? That it's so easy for us to drift into spiritual complacency and wander into fountains or down one-way streets the wrong way or other dangerous places because we let our guard down, right? And we fail to acknowledge all the danger that is around us. We, we cannot allow ourselves to let our spiritual guard down. And so Paul was certainly concerned about the many pitfalls there are for believers. And so he calls on us to watch out. Look out. Be on guard. Open your eyes to the dangers that are around you. And so in our text this morning, we see that Christians must safeguard ourselves in the gospel. What does that mean? Christians must safeguard ourselves in the gospel. Well, we, we have something we have to do to guard. Obviously, God keeps us. We know that. But Peter writes about that. But we still have a responsibility to safeguard ourselves in Christ. And so uh, we're going to study three directions we must look to safeguard ourselves. Three directions we must look. First direction we need to look is look up. Look up. Paul just commended the 
the godly examples of Timothy and Epaphroditus in chapter 2, right? They were self-forgetful, others-oriented. They were following the humble example of Jesus and the attitude of Jesus that we are supposed to follow as well, right? And now you might think he's wrapping up his letter. Why might you think that? Look at verse 3, or verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. So Paul says, finally, my brothers. Now this finally, I call a preacher's finally. You guys know what a preacher's finally is? A preacher says finally, and then 20 minutes later he ends, right? There was a little boy whose dad was a pastor. This is not personal example. There's a little boy whose dad was a pastor, and the little boy asked his dad, what did you mean by the word finally in your sermon? And the father replied, nothing. In all seriousness, when I was in seminary, we had professors that told, would warn us, said, don't say finally unless you're really going to end it, okay? Because that cues people. When you hear finally, you start packing things up and get ready, right? So, so is that what Paul is doing here? He says finally, and then he drops another two chapters on them. Well, it's pointed out here, this word finally had come to serve as a loose connective particle, so it could also have the meaning of so then or to go on, okay? So then or to go on. And so uh, we should not view the material from chapter 3, verse 1 to chapter 4, verse 7 as, you know, Paul's getting ready to land a plane. He's just throwing a bunch of extra stuff at the Philippians before he does. That's not the point, okay? So he picks up And what does he command them to do? The first thing he commands them to do is what? Rejoice in the Lord, right? Rejoice in the Lord. And he says to write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it's safe for you. Now, what same things is he writing about that's no trouble for him, that's going to be safe for the Philippians? Some believe that he's referring to what he's about to warn them about, which is a group of false teachers called the Judaizers, okay? And and so if he's talking about to write the same thing to you again, to warn you to be safe against the Judaizers, it would mean that at some place or some time, Paul had written to the Philippian church and said, hey, be on guard against the Judaizers. And so some believe that's the case. I don't think that's a safeguard Paul is referring to. Because the closest reference point to the same things is his command to rejoice in the Lord. Now, has Paul already written about the believers rejoicing in the Lord in the book of Philippians? He has. We've seen commands to to rejoice in chapter 2, verse 17 and 18 and verse 29. Paul calls on them to rejoice. Now, this is easy to read right over for us. Okay, because we hear it all the time, rejoice in the Lord, we do. And, and we can miss this as an absolutely crucial way Christians can safeguard ourselves in the faith. Paul is showing us an essential way for us to gain stability and strength in our lives, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter how many ups and downs you're facing, this is a way that's going to ground you. This is a thing you can do every single day that's going to help you get through the day. It's going to give you strength. It's going to protect your soul. What is it you can do? Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Now, we don't rejoice in our circumstances, do we? Some days you'll have great circumstances. Other days you're going to have terrible circumstances. Okay? We are not to rejoice in our job. Some days you're going to have a great day at work. Other days you're going to have a terrible day at work, and you're not going to rejoice in that. Sometimes you're going to lose your job, right? He tells us to rejoice where? In family? Well, well, no, not necessarily in family because as much as we love and care for our family, one day your family might be gone. And you can't rejoice in that. He tells us to rejoice in the Lord because rejoicing in the Lord is a perfect rejoicing. It's an indestructible joy. You, know, you, know, you want to know why? Because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can never lose Jesus. No matter what your circumstances are, no matter what's happening in your life, 
you will never lose Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. He can't change. We can always rejoice in the Lord because his promises are eternal and they are certain. And so we can always rejoice in the Lord because he's a rock. He's a fortress. He's a strong tower for us. And people walk around in so much fear today. You see it? You experience it. There's so much fear. There's anxiety. There's believers who are concerned about the future. What's going to happen? Who who wins the election? What's going to take place? And the reality is our joy is not found in the security of our nation. It's not found in the security of our work. It's not found in the security of our family. It's not found in the security of our circumstances. It's found in the security of Jesus and what he's done for us. That's why Nehemiah told the people, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You need strength to face today. You need stability to get through a day. Rejoice in the Lord. Praise him. Look around at how he's blessed you. He's given you the greatest gift you could ever receive. He's given you eternal life. He's given you forgiveness of sins. There's no greater gift you could ever get than Jesus Christ himself. And so we should rejoice. That's a safeguard for us. And we need to realize that learning to rejoice in the Lord is a great safety measure for our souls. All right, that's, that's when you realize it's a great, Paul says, it's no trouble for me to write again, rejoice in the Lord, and it's safe for you. Why? When you rejoice in the Lord, it anchors your soul. Okay, it aligns your heart with the Lord. Do you know why? Because when you are rejoicing in the Lord, you want to know what you're not doing? When you're rejoicing in the Lord, you're not grumbling and complaining. You, you hear that? When you're rejoicing in the Lord, you're not worrying, and you're not scared. When you're rejoicing in the Lord, you are not able to continually feed your envy and your bitterness. And so we need to realize making a regular daily habit of rejoicing in the Lord will guard your soul from all kinds of poisonous ways of thinking and acting and speaking. So I'm just curious, practically speaking, what is your daily routine of rejoicing? You have one. You just wait around for something to rejoice in. Uh, Let me just encourage you to make this a systematic, regular way you, you live your life, that you find times, you find reasons, you look for reasons to rejoice in the Lord every single day. We're going to come back to it because in the next chapter, Paul says in, in Philippians 4, 4, what? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice, Right? Make this a habit. It's going to safeguard your soul. You can never get to the bottom of rejoicing in Jesus Christ. When you find out that you've exhausted all his blessings, you have my permission to stop rejoicing. Okay? Until you get there, you better rejoice in the Lord. And you'll never get to the bottom of that joy. We're going to spend all eternity, you know, as Amazing Grace says, right? When we're there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll still have reasons to praise and rejoice in the Lord. And so you're, you're never going to get to the bottom of it. This goes along with preaching the gospel to yourself every day. As you confess your sins, you rejoice, practice this, meditate on his grace, meditate on his mercy, Meditate on his forgiveness. And if you are doing that, how can you not rejoice? How can you not praise him? And so I, this hit me, brothers and sisters. If we're going to faithfully follow the Lord Jesus, if our souls are going to be safeguarded, we better learn how to do this well. To rejoice in the Lord every day, praising him for what he's done for us. So the first direction we need to look is look up. Look up and rejoice. Second direction we must look at to safeguard ourselves in the gospel is to look out. Look out. Verse 2 is a striking verse, okay, for several reasons. First of all, it's very terse. Paul uses the same command three times in this verse. Look out, look out, look out. Do you think he's trying to get our attention? Right? He's alerting the church to a danger they need to guard against. They need to open their eyes. They need to watch out. Okay? They can't afford to become complacent. 
They need to be aware of a danger that can easily slip in amongst them. And also, not to give it away, but verse 2, what he's warning them about essentially is false doctrine. Okay? Doctrine matters. Paul's very concerned about the church believing false doctrine, lack of truth. And so don't minimize the importance of good and true doctrine in the Christian life. So let me ask you a question. How differently would you walk into a room if before you went into the room, I said to you, hey, just to let you know, inside that door, there's a rattlesnake somewhere, okay? How would you approach then, say you had to get in there for some reason, how would you walk in that room? Some of us were out. We're just like, I'm just not going to do it, right? But if you had to go in, how would you walk in that room if you had the knowledge, okay, somewhere in this room is a poisonous rattlesnake. You're going to be extra careful, aren't you? You're going to have your eyes open. That's what Paul is doing here in giving this warning. So what danger is Paul so concerned about? Well, Paul is going to give three strong commands And he's given these three strong commands to describe the same three people, the the same groups of people, okay? So take a look at verse 2. Paul says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. He's talking about the same group of people here in verse 2, okay? Now notice he uses three different ways to describe them. I would say they're very creative ways. They're very ironic ways he describes them. The group of people he's talking about are called Judaizers, okay? And these are people that Paul writes about in the book of Galatians. These are people that Paul confronts in the book of Acts. We studied that in Acts. They were people who were advocating that Gentiles, in order to be truly saved, had to believe in Jesus, but also be circumcised, Believe in Jesus, but also observe the laws of Moses. That's what they were advocating, the ceremonial laws of Moses. What I like to call them is they're Jesus plus people. You know what Jesus plus people are? You need Jesus plus. Yes, 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 Jesus. They're not saying you don't need Jesus. They're saying you need Jesus plus circumcision, right? Or Jesus plus Sabbath observation. Right? Jesus plus sacrifices and offerings. You could fill in the blanks. So I call them Jesus plus people. What does Paul call them? He calls them dogs. Look out for the dogs, right? Now, I, I know we live in a very dog friendly society. We love our dogs, right? Don't we? We have doggy spas and doggy daycares, and, you know, we have special refrigerated, refrigerated units at the grocery store for special fancy dog food, right? So, so we love our dogs, but you have to realize in the ancient world, they did not. They did not love dogs. They viewed dogs as worthless and vulgar. And G. Walter Hansen explains, He says, dogs were not lovable, huggable pets and companions in Paul's Jewish culture. They were regarded as the most despicable, insolent, and miserable of creatures. Dogs were despised because they would eat anything, including dead animals, human corpses, and their own vomit. Are you surprised? Our dogs drink out of toilets, right? How about that for man's best friend? So understand that in that world, to call somebody a dog, that's a sick burn, right? That's a, that's a low blow. You're, you're really going after somebody to call them a dog. Now, to add a layer of irony here, faithful Jews often would use the word dog in a religious sense. They referred to Gentiles as dog because they were unclean. They were uncircumcised. They did not obey the laws of Moses. Ritually speaking, they were dogs. They were unclean. And of course, the Jews viewed the Gentiles that way all the time. And so they looked down upon them. They were outside of the covenant community of Christ, or a covenant community of God. So do you see the great irony here from Paul? Because Paul's writing to who? Jews or Gentiles? Philippians. They're Gentiles, largely, right? He's writing to a bunch of Gentiles, and he says, it's actually the Judaizers who are the dogs, They're the unclean ones, right? They're the ritually unclean people. 
Moises Silva points out the reality here. He says the great reversal brought in by Christ means that it is the Judaizers who must be regarded as Gentiles. And the Gentiles are to be regarded as Jews. Right? And so Jesus comes along, and what did he do? He brought the outsiders in. He makes the unclean clean. He gives the outcast a home, right? But for those who think they are righteous in themselves, that they're justified by their good works, they actually are not on the inside, they're on the outside. And they're actually not clean, they're impure, okay? But notice that Paul does not just call them dogs. What else does he call them? Another ironic word here. Evil doers. Literally, the word is evil workers. Okay? Evil workers. Now, think about this. You see the irony here. Paul is warning a church of Gentiles against evil workers. And the irony is these evil workers that he's warning about are people who are fixated on good works. Right? Right? They're fixated on good works, and Paul calls them evil workers. Now, should Christians do good works? That wasn't that long ago we studied that, right? That that Paul calls on the Philippians and us to work out our salvation in fear and trembling, for it's God who's at work in us to will and to do that which is pleasing to him. So we are called to good works, and Paul wants us to do good works, but what he's pointing out here is anytime you're doing good works— thinking that you are justifying yourself by those works, it's evil. If you think you can earn your way to heaven by being good and doing good works, it's wicked. It's evil. That's what we need to understand when we start becoming Jesus plus people. Where we won't deny Jesus, but we say, yes, you need Jesus, but also baptism. Now, should you be baptized? Yes. Is it, is it the only way you're going to be saved? No. You're saved by faith alone, by grace alone, and Christ alone. Right? So when we start adding things, you need Jesus plus church attendance or Jesus plus charity giving, whatever, you are doing evil because you're trying to add to the gospel. You're trying to add. And when you add to the gospel, you know what really you're doing? You're taking away from the work of Jesus on the cross. Okay, so whenever we try to add to the gospel and the, of what Jesus has done in giving us the free gift of salvation, we're guilty of being evil, evil workers. So notice here how strong Paul's language is, and you see that Paul uses very strong language when people mess around with the gospel, right? You, you read Galatians, Galatians, Paul gets a little unhinged there. I mean, he's like, hey, I just wish you'd just go ahead and emasculate yourselves if you think circumcision is so important. Just go ahead. Anytime the gospel was at stake, Paul got very upset, right? And he defended it. He got angry. And so he warns them, watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evildoers. Thirdly, what else does he say? Look out for those who mutilate the flesh, those who mutilate the flesh. Again, uh, strong language. Basically, it says the mutilators. Watch out for the mutilators. Now, maybe that would make for a good football team name. I don't know. But uh, here he's warning. It's a play on words with the word circumcision. Okay? Circumcision was the sign of the covenant between God and Abraham. Now, here's the question. Was Abraham justified by being circumcised? Was he? Did God say, hey, you got circumcised. That's it. You're righteous. No, absolutely not. How was Abraham justified? By his faith. And after he trusted in God's promises and was declared righteous, it was then after that that he was circumcised to show that he believed the promises of God. And what Paul is doing here is he's pointing out how pointless and worthless rituals and religious rites are if they're devoid of faith. So you can practice all kinds of religious works, and you can practice all kinds of good works, but it's, if it's not coming from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's worthless. So the significance of circumcision, if it's without faith, is just mutilation. That's what Paul is saying here. That's what Paul is indicating. And the Israelites were tempted to just go into mindless religious observations, okay? 
And that gave them a ground of boasting. And even in the Old Testament, God said what? He didn't care. Most of all, he cared about that their hearts were circumcised. Right? And we see Moses talking about that, and Jeremiah talking about that, and Ezekiel talking about that. So, if all you have are rituals and no faith, then it's just mutilation. And I I would hear people talk about communion this way as I grew up in the church. People often had this kind of mystical understanding of communion that somehow it's going to add to your justification. Now, I knew that when people were sick and they thought they might die, they would say, I need communion. I need the pastor to come and bring communion to me. Why? Because they believed that somehow taking communion was going to help their justification. It was going to help them be righteous. And so we have to be careful here because whether it's circumcision or baptism or communion or other religious rites and rituals, we have to understand those things have no meaning outside of having a personal faith in Jesus Christ. Zero. Okay? Without faith, circumcision is mutilation. That's what Paul says, okay? Baptism without faith is a bath. Communion without faith is a snack that, quite frankly, doesn't fill you, right? If it's devoid of faith in Jesus Christ, it's a ritual, and it's mindless, and it's not going to help, okay? We're not saved by observing rites and rituals. You're only saved by trusting in the Lord Jesus, And that's why Paul gives these sharp warnings. This is why he says, look out. Look out. Look out. Watch out for anybody who's trying to add something to the gospel of Jesus or take away something from the gospel of Jesus. And so this takes us to our third area that we need to look for safeguarding ourselves in the gospel. So we need to look up. We need to look out. Thirdly, who who can guess? We need to look in. Thank you. Yes, good prepositions there, right? Out, up, in. Oh, up, out, in. So we need to look in. Verse 3, Paul paints a picture of what a true believer looks like. Look at verse 3. He says, for, again, remember, he's writing Gentiles here. We are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So Paul this is Jewish language. They would call themselves the circumcision. They boasted in that. That was the sign of the covenant, right? And so Paul, writing to a bunch of Gentiles in Philippi, says, we are the circumcision, right? And so he's contrasting these Gentile believers with the Judaizers, and he says it's actually the Gentile believers who are the true people of God. They're the covenant people of God under the new covenant, What he means is that those who are trusting in Jesus Christ are God's true people. And so in Galatians, Paul says that Gentile believers in Jesus Christ are part of the Israel of God. Did you know that? That we are the Israel of God, the people of God. That's how he refers to the church. In Romans chapter 9, verses 6 and 8, Paul says, But it's not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but children of the promise are counted as offspring. This is what it means when we tell the kids and teach the kids how to sing Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons are Father Abraham. I'm one of them, and so are you, right? So let's just praise the Lord. I would get really dizzy if I went further. But it's the reality that what Scripture teaches us is that if you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a son or daughter of Abraham, children of faith. Now, obviously, God has a plan for his people, Israel. We believe that. We know that. But understand, we've been grafted into that tree. And we are part of God's true covenant people. And that's what Paul is saying here to the Philippians when he says, we are the circumcision, guys. You don't don't need to be circumcised to be part of the circumcision. That's what he's saying here. And now he gives three evidences that shows who are the true people of God, who are truly God's children. First, he mentions spirit-filled worship. Look back at verse 3. He says, for we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God. Now, what does that mean? Have you worshipped by the Spirit of God? I hope you have. I believe you have. I think we have today, right? 
In John chapter 3, Jesus had a conversation with one of the great teachers of Israel named Nicodemus. And you remember that conversation, right? Jesus told Nicodemus, for anyone to see the kingdom of heaven, what must they do? They must be born again. Born of water and the Spirit, right? They must be born of the Spirit. Because we're all dead in our sins and trespasses. What we need more than anything else is to be regenerated. We need to be born again. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit to regenerate us. That's what Paul writes in Titus 3, right? He saved us not because of good works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by what? The washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit regenerates. He takes the heart of stone out of us and replaces it with a heart of flesh. That's what he does. And so... Once you're born of the Spirit and your blind eyes have been opened to who Jesus is, well, guess what? Then you can truly begin to worship. Then you can truly begin to understand who God is. And that's why just one chapter later in John's Gospel, Jesus is having a conversation with a Samaritan woman at a well. Right? And one of the questions she had was about worship. Because she knew the Jews and Samaritans differed about what true worship was. The Samaritans believed true worship can only happen at Mount Gerizim. The Jews believed what? True worship can only happen where? Mount Zion, Jerusalem, right? And how did Jesus answer? Did he say, Samaritans are way wrong. You got to go to Jerusalem. Is that what he said? No, this is what Jesus says in John 4, 23 and 24. He says, The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. What does it mean when he says God is spirit? You know what it means? It means he's not confined to a body. God the Father is not confined to a body. It also means he's not confined to a certain building in a certain city, in a certain country. He's not, right? And all true worship of God must be empowered by the Holy Spirit and in accordance with the truth of God's word. And Jesus himself is called what? The truth. The truth. So if you ever walk into a worship service here or someplace else, and there are things happening there that are in direct violation to the truth of God's word. That's false worship and you should avoid it. Get out. Right? Because God's looking for true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Filled by the Holy Spirit. Okay? But not only will we have we spirit-filled worship as an evidence of God's true people. A second evidence is Christ-focused joy. Christ-focused joy. Paul says the people of God are those who worship by the Spirit of God and do what else? Glory in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to glory in Christ Jesus? Do you know what it means? Quite simply, it means all of your boasting is in Jesus only. All of your boasting is in Jesus only. It means all of your confidence, all of your assurance is based in what Jesus has done for you and not what you have done for him. That's what it means to glory in Christ. It means your only hope in life and death, as the Heidelberg Catechism says, is that we are not our own, but belong body and soul, both life and death, to God and to our Savior Christ Jesus. All right? To glory in Christ is to realize that we can do absolutely nothing to save ourselves and that Jesus has done everything to save us. To glory in Christ is to believe that Jesus is an all-sufficient Savior. And so we say that. We confess that. Do you believe that? So often we say, yes, Jesus is our Savior, and then we're trying to add stuff to make sure God loves us and try to add stuff to, to build up merit in the kingdom. True believers will realize our only hope, our only boast, the only place we're going to glory is what Jesus has done for us. We're going to realize the only thing we brought to the table for our salvation is the sins that made it necessary. He did all the work. And so we're going to get really good at pointing people to Jesus. 
right? We're going to get really good at being like John the Baptist saying, he must increase, I must decrease. It's about he has done. It's not what I could ever do. That's one of the marks Paul says of being a true member of God's people is that you're going to glory in Christ, not in yourself. And this takes us to the third evidence, which goes along with the second. Paul says, we put no confidence in the flesh. And so there's a third evidence of self-denying trust. Self-denying trust. We don't put any confidence in the flesh. We put all of our confidence where? I just said it. In Jesus, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this goes to the old proverbial question at heaven's gate. I don't think this is going to happen, by the way. But if say when you got to heaven's gate and God's standing there and says, hey, why should I let you in? What are you going to say? What are you going to say? Let me tell you the wrong answer. The wrong answer is anything that has to do with what you've accomplished. Any good works you've done, any church attendance you had, any Bible studies you led, you fill in the blanks, right? Anything that you have accomplished is the wrong answer. John Calvin, the great reformer, says putting confidence in the flesh is everything that's outside of Christ. Everything where you're not pointing to Jesus and what he did for you is putting confidence in the flesh, so whether it's circumcision or baptism or, or communion or what, you fill in the blanks, your giving record, whatever it is. I, 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 I entered the ministry. I was a pastor all my life. Or I was a missionary. If that's where your confidence is, you're sunk. Because you're not saved by being in ministry. You're saved by Jesus and Him alone. Heaven help us if God would ever ask us that question and we start pointing to ourselves. Point to the Lord Jesus Christ because we can't save ourselves. The true people of God boast only in Jesus, knowing we are monuments of his mercy. We are trophies of his redeeming grace. And that's alone. And so we, we don't want to turn the wrong way down a one-way street. Right? That's scary. It's dangerous. Embarrassing. We don't want to fall into a fountain because we're not looking up. Paul is calling on believers to open their eyes. Practice safety in the Christian life. First, by looking up. Rejoice in the Lord. Make that your daily habit. Not just once a day, but maybe all throughout the day. Right? Rejoice in the Lord. Look up. But also look out. Be on guard against anyone messing with the gospel. Anyone taking away from Jesus' work. Anyone trying to add to Jesus' work. Anyone who's trying to look for another Savior. That's not Jesus Christ. And thirdly, we need to look within and just stop and examine ourselves. We need to look at our own hearts and say, okay, the worship I'm offering to God, is it genuine? Is it earnest? Is it sincere? You can ask that yourself right now. Why are you here today? Are you here because somebody wants you to be here? Are you, are you here to prove something to somebody? Are you here because you love God and you want to worship Him and praise Him? Is our worship sincere? Is it in accordance with the truth? Is it filled by the Holy Spirit? And who are we glorying in? Who are we boasting in? Is it ourselves? Is it what we've accomplished? Is it what we might do? Or is it Jesus only? Is Jesus your only hope in life and death? Maybe you don't have any confidence about eternity. And you don't have any confidence about where you're going to spend the rest of your life for all eternity. And here's the good news. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Trust in what he has accomplished for you and you'll be redeemed. But understand, it's not something we earn. It's not something we could accomplish. It's something we receive with our hands open. The the open hands of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's keep our eyes open to what God is calling us to be, how he's calling us to live, and also to be on guard against what we need to avoid. Let's pray. Father God, we give you all the praise for your truth, for the the reality of the gospel. Father God, we pray that you would help us to be aware, to be on guard, to keep our eyes open. May we not overlook the importance of our rejoicing in you every day, 
May we not overlook these commands startling that Paul gives. Watch out, watch out, watch out. Watch out for those who are messing with the gospel. May we never attempt to do that ourselves. Help us, Father, instead to glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Worship by the power of the Spirit, Lord, and put no confidence in our own flesh. Lord, we pray this all for your honor and glory and in Jesus' name. Amen.